Good evening, everyone, and welcome to us here from the British Dyslexia Association. It's so lovely to join you this evening during Dyslexia Awareness Week with our theme of Invisible Dyslexia. And I'm joined by some real experts. We wanted to join together during Dyslexia Week to have some really important, interesting conversations about where we're at these days with dyslexia for our whole community. We are recording the session this evening and we will send the recording afterwards as well so you can listen again and also if you've got some questions we've got lots to get through tonight but we'd love to hear from you as well so please do use the question the Q&A box that you will see on this Zoom platform okay so that's a little bit of housekeeping we'll get down to our session this evening it's a real honour to have BDA Chief Executive with us this evening Gillian Ashley and I know she wants to say a few words to everybody first so over to you, Gillian. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the session. Thank you, Donna. Um, we're delighted that you've all chosen to join us tonight. It's a really important topic. And I have a message for you. We want to let you know about how many of the 10% dyslexic population are hiding behind closed doors, afraid to reveal their disability, and who are maybe feeling helpless to help themselves. You may well be one of them or wondering if you are dyslexic or you might know someone who might need help. Or indeed, you might have a child whose difficulties may be unidentified or who is feeling vulnerable and different. We know at the British Dyslexia Association that dyslexia can be a hidden disability. It is a specific learning difficulty as is dyscalculia where working memory and processing speed difficulties can, for example, affect things like literacy and numeracy and organisation skills. And they can have an impact on our learning and our day-to-day -day lives. And we're very conscious that today in our audience, you may be experiencing those things yourself. At the British Dyslexia Association, these issues are not invisible to us. We recognise them. And in this session, we hope to explore them with you and to offer some empowering solutions to move forward. So there's no pressure on the panel at all. <laughs> Thanks, Gillian. And it's great you're going to stay with us during the broadcast, aren't you, Gillian? So it'd be lovely to hear from you as and when, because yes, we've got some questions, but this is very much an informal discussion between these wonderful experts tonight. So we're in for a treat, everyone. So it gives me great pleasure beyond introducing our CEO to you to say good evening to Sue Floor, MBE. She is our head of policy and research at BDA. She's also head of Helpline. Hi, Sue. I don't know if you want to say a few words before we get started um, this evening. Well, I think you said it all there, Donna. Um, uh, yeah, I'm head of policy at BDA. I am a specialist teacher and also a diagnostic assessor. And here are my lovely colleagues. We all work together and they bring their um, issues to me and I take them forward with Helen to government and decision makers to try and make it a better life for dyslexics. Brilliant. Thank you, Sue. And you've mentioned Helen. Yeah. Hi, Helen. Do you want to say a few Hello. words to everyone? Yeah, I'm the Knowledge and Information Manager at BDA. I work with Sue on the policy side and also supporting the helpline. I originally joined as a volunteer um, and I'm also a workplace needs assessor and a parent of two dyslexic children. Brilliant. Thank you, Helen. And that brings me on to Kim and Kath, our dynamic duo who manage <laughs> BDA helpline. Uh, such an important job. Kim, good evening. Hello. Hi, my name is Kim Brown. Um, I'm also a specialist teacher and a diagnostic assessor for adults who are dyslexic, either in education or the workplace. I've been working in this really fascinating field for over 25 years. I've worked for the BDA on lots of projects over that time, but specifically on the helpline for the last three years. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Kim. Uh, we're in very expert hands tonight. You're spoiling us, guys. And then we've got Kath. Hi, Kat. Hey, um, Kim and I manage the helpline together my, and her background is quite different to mine. My background is in education, in primary education. I've worked in um, a few countries as just a classroom teacher as well as being a SENCO. Um, so I've sort of gathered knowledge along the way. 
um, and I started as a volunteer on the helpline um, about five years ago, and now I'm helping manage with, with Kim. Um, Oh, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, Kath. So as I say, we can think of no better experts, guys. So off we go. So I wonder if we could start with you, Sue, and then please feel free, ladies, to chip in as we go. Where do we feel people are at this week? Obviously, Helpline is open for business all the time, but this week's a particularly busy one. So, Sue, what, where do you think people are at this week thinking about some of the themes Gillian's talked about, the theme itself of invisible dyslexia? Yeah, I think there's been so much exposure that it's opened up um, a can of worms for quite a lot of people. And hearing the word mentioned, people have began to wonder if they are, <clears throat> or they, they, they know they are, and they want to know more about it. And they've decided that they're not going to hide anymore and that they are going to be more open. Our lines have really been inundated with calls and so, so have our emails. And, you know, it's really quite sad, the people that are coming forward now, um, having, having hidden uh, people who've um, perhaps, you know, lost their jobs and are afraid now to fill out forms, lost their partners who have been supporting them, hiding behind this, not knowing where to go, some resorting to food banks now just simply because they can't fill in a form and afraid to open up. Um, yeah, it's, it's been quite a distressing week from, uh, mm. from a big point of view, from, from adults, but also uh, parents have been ringing as well about, about their children. Mm. I mean, maybe Kim can tell us more about the, the adults that um, she's, she's found calling on the helpline. You want to, Kim? Yeah, yeah, we've had lots of adults, and we always have lots of adults calling the helpline. Um, lots of people have been ringing who maybe are embarrassed about their writing skills, and that can either be at work, so being affected at writing emails or reports, or just in their day-to-day -day personal life. Some people phone us saying that they find writing a text really difficult, let alone an email, and that can knock their confidence. Um, so lots of difficulties people have have been revealed. Um, people are often worried about replying to a text or an email because of their error rate and difficulties with proofreading. So we've had parents phoning saying they don't want to maybe write to the school or write in their child's book because of a fear of their error rate, which makes them appear disinterested, which they're not. So uh, people can often be embarrassed to talk about those difficulties. So one of the things we try and do on the helpline is give people solutions, really. And um, we often try to talk to people about if they've got a smartphone that there's so much a smartphone can do to help someone manage their literacy difficulties and their reading difficulties. Because a smartphone, you can download an app that can read aloud or certain smart, they're all slightly different. Some smartphones, you can go into the features that are called accessibility tools and you can activate the screen reading features. And then you can use the phone to read everything out loud. So someone could highlight an email and have it read aloud or they could highlight a text that they've just written to check if it's got errors in it so that can be a fantastic uh, solution for some people also a phone can be used for dictation so if someone's got spelling problems they can just speak to their phone and ask it how to spell a word like escalator or something and then the uh, internet will read it back and read will give them a spelling so, and lots of computers and um, laptops have got these features. They're called either something like immersive reading or screen reading or dictation. So often people just have to try and navigate how to switch these features on or how to find them. But once someone can be talked through that or find someone to help them with that, then there's a, a lot of solutions um, that people often don't know about. So we can try and talk people through those. Yes. Can I say, uh, Kim, I know that um, many, many people are actually afraid to ask friends to show them and are afraid to ask their children because they've hidden behind this and not not been able to tell them that they can't read. Yeah. Or write. And I know that you've actually talked them through it on the phone and shown them, haven't you? And pointed them towards yeah. YouTube to get it right. So we, we can all um, adapt um, and, and get strategies to overcome these problems. It, doesn't have to be the end, does it? Yeah, no, no, there's, we, I find with lots of people in the workplace, if they have some good software and some good tools, it can just make a tremendous difference to 
someone with their reading speed or their error rate. So I think often people don't realise that there are quite a lot of solutions out there. Yeah. So, I so think on Helpline, we try and point them to that. Yeah. Just pick up the phone and tell us what's worrying you and we we will help sort it out. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. The other, um, the other place you can look is there's all sorts of YouTube videos explaining how to do whatever you need to do on your phone. And whilst it's not always easy to find them, it is just a case of kind of just keep on trolling through YouTube because the chances are that somebody will have produced a little film to tell you how to activate talk to text or whatever it may be. So the, the information is out there. It's it's asking and, and sort of knowing where to look for it. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Do you feel that the theme of this uh, year's Dyslexia Awareness Week, Invisible Dyslexia, has, do you think that's enticed people to speak up more this time around about some of the almost secret concerns or hidden concerns, do you think? I think overall, sort of the, the profile of dyslexia is being flagged more in all kinds of you know people yes. on the tv often admitting they're dyslexic and hopefully broadening the the view that it's not it's just reading and writing because obviously it is more than that and i think that message is getting out there whether it's you know a tv presenter talking about it or you know british dyslexia association facebook group yeah yeah that awareness, I think, has been invaluable, hasn't it? OK, thanks, guys. I mean, Kim's talked about adults and Sue has. And we've had a question about um, liking to know more about software for professionals in the NHS. So if I can leave that with you for a few minutes, Kim, just to ponder. I know I've put you on the spot there. We've got lots of questions coming through. And if we can't come back to you for that individual, please do reach out to us on Helpline with that question and we'll, we'll um, the guys will get you some answer. But our, what we've also been having people asking already is, what about children? So, Helen, I don't know if you want to share your thoughts on the back of what Kim's been talking about adjustments and technology. What about children? Yeah, I would say as, as a parent, it's never too um, soon to try and introduce your children to technology. It's amazingly empowering for a child who is struggling to put their own words down on paper to be shown sort of dictation software and to just maybe speak into a phone and put together a little story. I mean, you don't have to worry about the punctuation and grammar and all those kind of things. It's just getting them to be able to see those words come up on a page. Because what you're trying to do is obviously inspire them, despite of some of their challenges they might have to want to go on and do more. And then obviously, you know, as children get older, there's lots of programs on sort of touch typing and things that you can do. I mean, you know, it's obviously important that schools are teaching handwriting, but in reality, as we all get into the workplace and all become adults, you know, we are more and more using technology. So our children are going to be using this technology as they, they grow older. So there's no harm in um, getting them using it from an early age. Thanks, Helen. I think- and, um, I Oh, think, sorry, Kath, please do, sorry. do share. I was just gonna say in a way, the all the school lockdowns have fast forwarded the use of technology in schools. Um, especially in primary schools. So I think, um, as Helen mentioned, touch typing, you know, if, if young children start to touch type, you know, and become quite proficient, it, it does eliminate a lot of the difficulties they may find later on when they start to use technology for their, for their work. Um, and another thing I wanted to say is if people are looking at investing in technology for schools, or for school, it is quite important to talk to the school because what you don't want to do is go and buy something that is not compatible with whatever the school uses. So make sure that you're not you're investing in the right thing. And if your child's in year five or six, possibly speak to the secondary school because ultimately that's when they will probably use the technology the most. I think that's quite important that people make sure if they are investing a lot of money in technology that they're, they're getting the right thing or getting what they think they, they're getting. Um, we need to say though, that there is a lot of freeware out there. So before parents go out spending a lot of money, try the free stuff. Yeah, it's there. Ring us think, and we'll tell you where to find it. <laughs> Kath raises a really good um, point because in primary schools and secondary schools, we know that 
they've been quite slow for many reasons, men, mainly financial, um, to come on board with technology. And we, act, we know that that is what works for our children. Um, whereas at university level, they can access that support much more easily through DSA. So in a mm. very strange sort of way, the lockdown has forced that acceleration of accessing software. And that's a really great point because I, I think now schools can see that those difficulties can be alleviated through using a laptop or through software such as text to speech and speech to text. How does the panel feel about parent power? Do we feel that um, parents should step back and leave things to teachers or, you know, what is the role in parents in terms of getting that balance right? Um, I think, I was to say, I think, you know, try and collaborate and work with the school, try and build a relationship. But obviously, as a parent, if you are concerned and often you see things at home that um, may not present at school, then, you know, you, you need to speak up and you need to be there to support the children. Yeah, I think um, parents need to realise that teachers uh, don't have any mandatory training in being able to identify um, dyslexia or to be able to support children. I mean, it is their job to try and find out now with the code of practice, but they don't always have that and they don't always see it with, with a big uh, class of children. And so it's very often um, easier for a parent to spot that there's something not quite right and not to be afraid to try and tackle it and to take up the matter with school or to try and support at home. So don't just leave it to the school, no. Many, many parents do, and they, they think, you know, that the school are taking care of everything, but things do go missing. So, you know, parents have a duty to watch out for themselves as well. I think schools as well. Sorry, I think schools will appreciate parents who are raising these, these potential issues and saying, what can I do at home to support my child? So if this, you know, if you go into school and the school says, actually, we're doing time, for example, next week, because a lot of dyslexic children struggle with telling the time. You know, if, the, if you can do a bit of that at home, that's great for your child. It's great for the school, you know, and you're all working and pulling in the right direction. So I think if the parents can ask specific questions and the, the schools can give specific answers and specific strategies that can be used at home, um, that's really useful for everybody. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. I mean, I think that coming out of the lockdown and going back into school, many parents have not felt that it's power to parents. They felt uh, disempowered, in fact, that being at home, um, trying to teach their children when they're not qualified as teachers has highlighted many of the gaps that the children have got. And they've been able to see that actually there's some help that is needed. So in that sense, it's empowering, but then not knowing what that help is and how to get it can be very deflating for families. Mm. And you know that's why we have our fantastic helpline um, so that parents can phone up and you can ask our advice on what to do. But Kath has given you and Helen very good starting points. Your best port of call is to speak to the school and to be really clear about what you've noticed and you know, try to ask them what is the help and get that specific help. So you know, take some along with you who can make the notes so that you don't have to be thinking and recording what's being said and you've got those notes to refer back to. I think it's good if the school can share what they are working on, but also to give you some timescales with this. So you know, if they say, we're going to be working on such and such a thing this term, you know, ask them, well, can we have another meeting just before Christmas or in January so that these things don't just go on and on and on. Everybody's getting together, not every week, obviously, but, you know, every six weeks, every eight weeks, just to focus everyone's attention and to monitor progress and then adapt and change programs as and when it's necessary. But I think everybody has mentioned communication and basically, you know, it's having open communication with the schools. Um, and also what we think progress is um, could be quite different from what parents think. So teachers may have an idea of what that progress looks like. And perhaps that's a conversation because parents might be expecting 
greater progress than they've seen in lockdown and reintegration back to school. And um, they might have been a little bit shocked in some cases to think what's actually happening. So yes, having that really clear dialogue is really key for all families. I mean, I have to say that schools, in my opinion, do an absolutely sterling job. They really try their best to provide within, you know, the climate that we're in to the best of their ability for children. But Sue raises a really good point. Our teachers get very minimal training on their teacher training, their initial teacher training. And so quite often it falls to the individuals to then search and look for some appropriate training. And often that comes out of times where they haven't known necessarily how to provide for the children in the class. So we're in a sort of a climate where we know that schools need the training um, of how to provide for children with specific learning difficulties, but they're not getting it. Thanks guys. And I suppose that's a nice segue into my department because I'm part of BDA training team. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, interestingly enough, actually, we have more parents coming on a lot of our virtual courses these days because they want to find out, I guess in line with everything the experts have said tonight, they want to find out how to do right by their own children as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to dip in, guys, to a question that's come through. I think it's a good time to ask this one. Um, what a parents come through and said, hi, I was wondering why my seven-year-old can't get assessed by a professional until she is nine years old please so any advice for that mum who's worried why seven-year-old not identified she's got to wait till her daughter's nine you want to answer that Julian? <laughs> sorry just unmuting on the spot um i was actually <laughs> i was thinking how how to answer that now that I don't think there's a clear cut reason why the school have made that decision. And it might be that they've got an intervention that the child is in and they're waiting to see if progress is made as a result of what they're providing. I mean, I don't know. So I'm just talking a little bit blind in the situation. Some schools, um, you know, provide all the way through primary and then they they actually will have an assessment carried out in year six because they know that what they've provided in primary has been a really solid and scaffolded education for the child, but they're worried about the child going up with unrecognized needs to secondary school. So some schools make that decision. I mean, ultimately there isn't a hard and fast rule to it because it's not statutory to have an assessment done at any specific age. And the code of practice, although it does refer to assessments, it uses it in quite a broad way. So actually the responsibility of the child is when they notice that there is a difficulty, uh, the responsibility of the school to the child is when they notice difficulty, they do have to do some sort of assessments. And that's where it's slightly woolly because that could be in-house assessments that they carry out themselves. I think it's a question of funding as well, isn't it, Gillian, if we're honest? And I think every parent should look at the website for a school and look at the special needs policy and the information um, there, because it will say there what their, what their policy is on assessing and monitoring and assessing. And uh, we, we don't um, think it's perhaps a good idea to assess before seven because of uh, you know, um, tests don't start really until they're five. So you can't really see that somebody's very behind until about seven but to leave it to nine is a bit was it nine Donna it was yes yeah. uh it's a bit unfortunate I think you know early early assessment is the key to a, a successful life don't you yeah yeah do we feel that that parent needs to reach out to helpline guys yeah I think, I think yeah. perhaps okay. they ought to or perhaps go and find out the exact reasons that school is giving and explore the support that's there now because it could be that if the school explores fully what support is in place, the parent may feel more, more at ease with what's going on. And again, as I said before, make a, make a second appointment to go and speak about a review date, you know, and whether that's in January. And in January, you can then look at what's gone on this term and say, OK, this is really not working. Can we talk about an assessment or actually this seems to be working, let's give it another few months. So I think possibly go to the school and just find out exactly what is happening. 
Thank you, Kath. And I, I guess on the oh, sorry, we? go for oh, it, Kim. Sorry. sorry. No, it's okay. Go say, for it. I was going to say a lot of a lot of parents ring the helpline and they haven't yet spoken to the school or the Senko about their concerns. So yeah. I think Kath's right that that speaking to the class two teacher and the Senko is a really good first step to find out what 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 they think and what screening tests they've done and what support and how concerned they are. Yeah. So that a collaboration can happen. Yeah, and I mean most most people with children will know that if you ask them you know, what have you done today? They will say nothing. Yeah. <laughs> so it is important to find out from the horse's mouth, so to speak, rather than just automatically, you know, kind of believe that they've done nothing that day. Yeah. Um, that made me smile, Kath. It ring it's so <laughs> true, isn't it, for those of us who've got children in our lives. Um, but still on children then. Um, if our, one of our children does get identification of dyslexia, are we wise to share that with our children? I mean, how do we handle that situation? What do we think? Expert? I think it very much depends. Sorry, it very much depends on the child. If you think it's going to be helpful, because for some children who perhaps as they're getting older, feels that they might they're stupid and everybody's better than them to actually say to them, well, the, the reason that this is hard for you is that you have dyslexia you know and, and talk about what that means um and for some children that really gives them a lot of comfort but if you think it's I think you have to judge your child's maturity you have to judge your child's um independence and whether it's something they're going to be able to understand I think you're right uh, it really much, very much depends on the child for some it could knock their confidence completely so you've got to choose the right time and know your child haven't you and you've got to choose the right language and there's lots of very nice um, books around to um, read to children that have got a very positive approach to what dyslexia is and there's a little um, webinar on our website under what is dyslexia that's a really nice explanation that's very positive about dyslexia being about differences and about strengths and not always being about difficulties so I think choice of words is very important too. It's one of my favourite videos that I really like it. You can be any. And I yeah. think, shall we pop that link in um, yeah. the, the email when we send the recording out, everyone? Oh, I think great. that'd be quite it nice. It yeah. shows that you can be anything if you're dyslexic. It doesn't matter. Yeah. You can yeah. follow your dream. Yeah. All those superpowers, Sue, isn't it? <laughs> in a similar vein, we've had a question through, again, about assessment for children, but this time, can a parent expect school to assess their child for dyslexia, or is it always going to be something that has to be self-funded? Who'd like to start us on that one? Well, I think we've really spoken about that, really, okay. haven't we? Look at the information um, uh, on, on the website for the school, their special needs policy, and it should say there at what point they will bring in um, a qualified person to assess. Um, if you can't see it there, then ask the school secretary for, for the policy. Every school has one and it will tell you. So um, I think you have to think as well, why do you want, why do you want that assessment? Uh, it's not always necessary. Uh, there are other things you can do before going and paying out for an assessment. Make sure that you know, the child is hearing properly, seeing properly, visually developed properly, uh, all those sort of things. All that information is actually on our website. So it's not always essential to rush off and get an assessment because what are you going to do with it once you've got it? It might give you the confidence to push and push to get the right support for your child, but it's a lot of money to pay out if you've got to pay it out. You've got to think about it carefully. It's not always essential. Yeah. I would Thank also you. say that schools should be putting in support where children need it without the need for an assessment. So they should be looking at interventions if they have concerns that a child is not progressing in line with sort of expectations for their age. Yeah, and that's the same for exam allowances, isn't it? If, if a child is reading at a slower rate than its peers or from what is average or writing speed is low, um, children can get exam allowances for their mocks and for their GCSEs without a full diagnostic assessment. It means the school has to provide some evidence. Absolutely. So, um, yeah. yeah, that's important to remember. Yeah, you, they, they won't be able to produce a diagnostic assessment to get those special arrangements. No. It does need to be done in school. So, 
think about it carefully. Yeah. I think also it's worth knowing that um, when you have a diagnostic assessment, um, it will come with recommendations, but the school's not obliged to actually put those recommendations in place. Mm -hmm. um, most schools will look at the recommendations and use them to scaffold help within their, their means, um, but they can't automatically put all the recommendations from a, a report in place. And we do you know, get teachers calling who say, we have this, this system in place which works for their school or their child, and a, a diagnostic assessment may not necessarily give access to anything more than what is currently there. Um, Absolutely. So it's worth bearing that in mind as well. Donna, I can see over a hundred questions there. I think we'll just have to run a, a webinar to answer all those questions. <laughs> Yes, well, uh, we're trying to get through. I think some of them are around similar themes, Sue. So luckily, I think as we're talking and I'm trying to sweep them up as we go, but you're right, uh, you know, we're in on days. It shows how important these issues are. Do you want to are. answer that NHS one? Well, we'll come back yeah. to that when we go back to adults. But I just wanted to check while we're on the subject of children again, this idea that I know for some parents who've got a few children, when one sibling, and maybe it's a younger sibling, seems to be on, for example, a, a higher reading book than the older, you know, brother or sister, but because there's dyslexia involved, you know, the older child is not quite there yet. Any thoughts on how we can sensitively handle that kind of a situation? Yeah, I think you just sort of, as a parent, you look at the strengths of the the other child and you sort of point out and you say, well, you know, this one might be good at reading, but actually you're a fantastic runner or you're a fantastic artist. So it's about making that child feel good and not comparing themselves on everything. So, you know, it's kind of finding those things and giving them some positive messages about themselves. Yeah, and it's also about talking around that reading is meant to be enjoyed, isn't it? Rather than being a, a competition about mm -hmm. who's better. That it's something that should be a pleasurable activity. And I think make sure they don't miss out on those books that they can't read. Listen to audio books and podcasts, um, just mm -hmm. so they're getting the same information and the, and the same pleasure, but in a different way. I think also we talked about, you know, whether to tell your child they're dyslexic or not, you can have the same conversation with the non-dyslexic child and say, look, you know, you're, you're really good at reading, but, you know, Kim has something called dyslexia, which means that it's hard for, you know, and, and you can explain it that way as well, so that everybody knows and understands what's going on. Absolutely, it's not a competition. Yeah, we're yeah. all good at something and it's finding out what we are good at that makes life happy really yeah mm, it comes back absolutely. to your superpowers again doesn't it yeah. finding new superpowers talking um, about happy in um in reading quite often when um a child is struggling with reading it's actually very stressful for the whole family yeah, and so parents who you know in all cases i don't know any parents who don't want the best for their children and will try their best but actually trying to teach your own child to read is an absolute nightmare, an emotional nightmare and everything. And so you may want to look at other ways. So paired reading is a really nice way of doing reading with your child where you don't actually have to get the, you're not teaching the child to read, but you're reading together at the same time. So they get all that benefit from um, reading the book, they get the fluency aspect, they get the comprehension and the meaning, but you're carrying all of that difficulty as the better reader. And it just takes all the pressure off you having to say, what is the first sound? Sound that word out, start with the beginning sound. You know, it's a nightmare. We've all been there, um, but do look to paired reading. It's absolutely fantastic. It's a good strategy. Yeah. Thanks, Gillian, Annex, and the other experts too. Um, we've got some issues as, re as well as some conversation starters really about the impact of COVID and lockdown on our children as well. What do we feel that uh, the impact of, on our children has generally been now, you know, post lockdown, um, but also for parents who may have dyslexia themselves trying to support their own children who, again, may have dyslexia. We know that dyslexia runs in families in that way. Any thoughts on that? You know, the way forward now beyond 
uh, COVID and post lockdown and so on? I think there were mixed results. And I think Helen's probably best oh. to tell us about that since you did a survey, didn't you? And ah, some brilliant. people came out well and some didn't. What do you think, Helen? Yes, I would say um, some parents found it very difficult to support their children. Um, and other children really benefited from being at home and having sort of one-to-one -one support. I think where parents were able to spend the time with children, they really benefited benefited from that but obviously a lot of parents weren't able to do that because they often had more than one child at home or they were trying to work full-time themselves as well. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other things that was really obvious to us in the survey was the amount of support that a lot of dyslexic children needed to be able to um, access online lessons and that was a rather a surprise to, to parents to really see that kind of continuous one-to-one -one support that that they they needed really to be able to access the curriculum and you know several parents the comments were they were really surprised how well their child had hidden their difficulties from them as parents and also from you know their classmates that it really wasn't known until they actually spent time with them on a day-to-day -day basis at home seeing how much they really were struggling to access those lessons. I think as well um uh, some found it really difficult exposing themselves on screen and having to write things and for their friends to see that they were making spelling mistakes. Um, well, didn't we find that as well? Yeah. Yes, and also the teachers also said it was quite difficult to read a class of children that were um, working remotely, you know, on a lesson and to kind of see those that were maybe struggling and, and needed the extra help. Um, and those children often reluctant to, you know, virtually put their hand up in front of a whole class, whereas actually face to face in the classroom, it's kind of easier to, to have that quiet word about something. Yeah. So mixed, Jonna. Yeah, well, we've had a, a question in the similar vein um, around somebody who's, who's said, as an adult with dyslexia, how can I teach my child to read? So any ideas of how we can support our adults with dyslexia in terms of supporting their own children with reading, if that's not, you know, something that they're really that great at as well? This is really, well, maybe... Well, well, we've had, we, we have had parents phone in helpline saying that, that they feel they have an error rate and then if their child is reading... Um, that, that they feel that they can't support their child's reading. And it could be that that, that child may benefit from maybe audio books yeah. or um, something like a scanning pen, which can, so they can be more independent with reading. Some schools do have some of these tools available, not all schools. Um, but that, that can be a question that people feel they lack confidence in their own skills. I think it's a good time for them to start to learn to read better themselves and to start back on the foundations. Um, perhaps, you know, to ask, first of all, ask the school what kind of scheme they're using, because things do vary in from one school to another, although uh, the government have sent out a directive recently on how teachers should teach to read. But um, if they're really, really struggling, I would suggest to go and get a book called Alpha to Omega. It's quite published quite a long time ago and been republished thousands of times. But this is this really gives a, a parent a step by step guide and they could teach themselves as they are teaching their child to read. Perhaps yeah. And actually, Sue, we do get parents that ring and say they feel their own reading has improved, that as they're working with the child, their, their confidence is growing and their sort of word recognition skills are, are growing. So the same with yes. maths as well. Where, yeah. where parents yeah. don't have that confidence with maths. So perhaps um, Gillian's got something to say about that. She's the maths teacher, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was waiting for an appropriate moment. I was gonna say, I'm gonna widen this up out to dyscalculia. Mm. Um, yeah, parents very often say that the maths that their children are doing is way beyond their ability to help or teach or do anything. Um, and, you know, that takes us right back to that place where we had lessons and randomly were asked questions in a maths lesson. And I, I don't know what the percentage of the population is that have got maths anxiety, but I would say it's quite high. And we all go back into that place of, oh my goodness, I, I can't do this. 
Um, but there are lots of ways of teaching things like maths, which is really fun. And, you know, especially primary school maths, where you've got things like fractions and you can use a pizza and you can divide it. And Sue, you can have a half and then you can ask your child, you know, how much of the pizza are you having? I'm going to have a half. And, you know, what, how much are you having? And you can use all of that language. The difficulty with maths is it's abstract. And so what we have to do with that concept is make it concrete. And the only way to do that is through practical maths so that children are doing maths and they're also using all of that terminology. And I think that helps a parent as well who's got some maths anxiety. Yeah, to go right back to foundations with them and to learn that way. Yeah. And I think, as Gillian said, you can use games for maths, but you can also play with words, you know, and, and again, if you're not confident to sit down and sort of teach your child, you know, play games with them, you know, letter games or boggle or scrabble or bananagrams, all that kind of thing. Um, and then you can lose and you don't need to be embarrassed if you lose. <laughs> you know, because that's the idea, someone's got to lose. Um, so yeah, I think it, it's it's kind of been inventive. And once you get your brain switched on to looking out for these opportunities and games, it does become easier. Um, but I don't know, things like Kindles as well, going back to the reading, you know, that you can work on together. You can sit and listen and watch and pick out words together. Um, but again, make it a game rather than come on, we're going to sit down and do some reading. Okay. Thank you, panel. And there's lots of people agreeing with you saying that playing and games really lowers anxiety across many different subject areas. OK, so I'm going to move away from children for the time being. And I'm aware, Kim, I'd sent you that challenge about the NHS <laughs> technology question as well, which I'm going to come to in a minute, if that's OK, because I want to talk about our students as well. A lot of our teenagers and young adults are heading back to university. We've had a number of questions in around what should I when should I go for a test what when should I be worried about myself what traits and characteristics should I be kind of almost looking for in myself before I take any formalized next steps so who'd like to start us on that I'm going to start I think there's an alarming statistic that says there's about 50 percent of um, people at university who have dyslexia who are actually diagnosed at at university and it's often a time when people find that kind of they're working on their own they're working in a different way than they have at school and that's where perhaps difficulties that they weren't really apparent to them start to become much more so. Um, I would say to anybody who knows that they're dyslexic already and had support at school if they haven't already done so then they should look to apply for disabled students allowance because that provides um, specific funding for equipment that they might need to maybe help them record lectures, for example, and um, take notes. And also can give them access to specialist study support, which is often the area that dyslexic individuals really struggle with, is that kind of planning um, and being responsible for their own deadlines, etc. So that, I would say, is the, you know, the start point for those who already know that they're dyslexic and maybe haven't actually put any support in place. Um, I think if you have concerns that you might be dyslexic, maybe you've um, worried about it for a while, but it's not something that was um, sorted out at school, then you know the first course of call probably at the university is to go and talk to the disability officer and see what's available um, in terms of assessments and whether there's any financial support available for getting assessed. Brilliant, thanks Helen. Any other thoughts on that one? for our students i think she said it all didn't you okay yeah perfect thanks helen um so in terms of our adults then we've got some questions about thinking about partners and so on who may have dyslexia and this is where because we're kind of looping around the different age groups here Kim I'll come back to you now with that NHS question if that's oh, okay yeah. so we yeah, had sure. the manager who'd said what can we use assistive technology wise in the NHS for colleagues any thoughts on that Kim well we've had many people from the NHS over the years come through our services and we often recommend that they would get a workplace needs assessment because people's 
what depending on what job they're in and depending on their level of difficulty they're going to need different types of solutions um so a workplace needs assessment would involve an interview with a specialist who particularly looks at the job description um, they can speak to the manager and then the main interview is with the employee about their job their role and the sort of pinch points in their job of what they might need so that makes me think of a, a person I spoke to who found taking notes when they were doing ward rounds quite difficult and the solution they used was to have a tablet that was a bit smaller than average so they could keep it in their pocket and then they would take notes on it and um, either dictate their notes or type them in so it would very much depend on the job but um, the apps that we talked about at the beginning the screen reading apps and the dictation apps would work on most platforms but sometimes a manager or an employee would need to navigate with their tech department to sort of release permissions so a specific member of staff could use specific technology within that locked um, platform. Yeah, I think we have a huge number of calls from NHS employees. It's we not do. surprising since it's one, it is, it the, is it the biggest employer? I, I don't know, but we do. And uh, that can make us think there's a huge problem in there, but I think there's just so many people working in there. And it, I think it's really encouraging that so many NHS trusts now are coming forward to Donna, aren't they? And having training with you. Yes. So I think yeah. the situation is going to get a lot, lot better. And I think when, when they have a needs assessment, a workplace needs assessment, Kim, I think the, the, the person should really ask for it to be factored in that their colleagues have training in dyslexia awareness yeah. so that they don't um, uh, think, well, what are you doing here? How did you get this job? You know, you've got a problem that they really understand that there are benefits to being dyslexic. Um, really Absolutely. And also, and also there's something called workplace coaching, which yeah. is can be funded through um, the government through access to work, which means an individual at work can have, I think it's 10 or 12 sessions with a specialist tutor to identify specific workplace problems. So it might be with proofreading, with writing reports, with organisation, organising emails. Um, and that can make a tremendous difference just to have that one-to-one -one tailored support while at work. I think it's yeah, also worth mentioning the... as well that they can have a support worker. So if they're very good, for example, if they're a wonderful surgeon, but they're absolutely awful on admin, they, the, the government could fund through access to work an admin support yeah. worker. So yeah, not it wouldn't well, be a cost to the NHS. So yeah. One you. of the questions that's gone up was how to get where, where would you find a workplace needs assessment? Well, um, if, if, if it's an NHS uh, or, or anyone, actually, I would say go to your occupational health person in, in your company and uh, organisation and ask for, for them to arrange it through, through us if you feel you're dyslexic, because you'll get the best, uh, um, the best assessor. I mean, you can get a free one through the um, government scheme, access to work, but that would be very genetic, uh, generic and it, it won't be really focused on your particular disability. So if you can get the trust in that case, the NHS trust to actually pay a little, it's only 450 pounds, I believe, to have a, a workplace needs assessment with us. I think you will get all the support and everything right that, that you need to be able to do your job properly. Thanks, Sue. And, um... You know, coming back to what we were saying, I know we're talking a lot about NHS, but it's similar with lots of big organisations, actually. Um, a lot of people say, why are so many, you know, members of the NHS, for example, who are neurodiverse? Because actually it's a great fit for the talents and skills of our neurodiverse community and what the NHS requires from the wonderful people who work there. And that brings us to a question that we've been asked a lot tonight. What are those gifts and talents what are the superpowers that we've alluded to this evening would anyone like to share what those gifts and talents may be for our dyslexia community who's going first <laughs> well there's so many isn't there you know lots of dyslexic people are very good at problem solving at overseeing situations uh, they're very good project managers because they can kind of visualize maybe what the components of everybody's job someone yeah. else I think, they can, no, I think they can see the answer before everybody else. 
that has Often, to go yeah. step by step. Um, yeah. Sometimes that can yes, be that's... quite difficult because, uh, like for example, in 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 maths and in, in school, you have to show the steps. But the dyslexic sometimes can see the answer, and then they'll be accused of cheating. Or <clears throat> the the art the art student doing their portfolio can see the end thing, but they must show step by step. But we have this superpower as Don refers to it as uh, being able to see the end result. And I think I think that's really wonderful. And a lot of employers will appreciate that. And I think just knowing, having to find your own way to do things that comes naturally, you know, much more easily to other people. And it doesn't have to be, you know, that you are brilliant at that, but just knowing that it's difficult for you to do A, B and C and being able to find and support your own strategies to achieve um, A, B and C using your own strength and initiative. Mm -hmm. And we've had people in the chat talking about um, being able to see things in 3D, thinking outside the box. It comes to all that problem solving creativity. Uh, I was with the construction industry last night on a different webinar, and those guys were talking a lot about determination. So it's this idea of never giving up. I'm really always giving a million percent, which has really come into its own, hasn't it, during COVID? Um, so a lot of people commenting on that, which is fantastic. Thanks, everyone. Keep the chat coming through. The other side that we've been asked a lot, guys, this evening. So they were the, some of the superpowers. What are some of the challenges that we associate with dyslexia then? What should people be looking out for either in the children? Somebody's talking about a partner. <laughs> what are we looking for in terms of some of those challenges associated with dyslexia? I think in a workplace that um, uh, often you might see things like um, a person appears to not necessarily know what the task or the job is and so may have a different outcome. So perhaps there's something there about processing what that is and how that's been explained to the person. And I, I think also um, time scales. when we put time in, involved in anything, we're all suddenly under a lot of pressure. And you know, if you're meeting deadlines, that can be quite overwhelming. So perhaps also thinking about how to manage those deadlines and perhaps spacing them out, breaking tasks into smaller chunks. And when we are doing anything really, some of you may be listening to us tonight and taking notes. And what we're doing there is we're accessing our working memory. So, you know, just to think that actually for a lot of people with dyslexia, they may have a poor working memory or working memory difficulties. So that is going to affect the vast majority of cognitive tasks that they undertake. And so as an employer, how are you going to support somebody? So those are, those are just some of the things that I would think in a workplace setting. Yeah, yeah well, thanks, Gillian. Following on from what Gillian was saying about that, I think the sort of multitasking, one of the um, problems with sort of working memory is particularly in meetings, people are trying to listen to the conversation and actually take notes. And so there's lots of practical things that can be done. I mean, you can delegate note taking to somebody else who feels that that's that something they can do so people are free to talk. Um, you can allow people to actually record meetings. I mean, now we have a lot of meetings by teams, obviously that's much easier because people can record them and, and listen back and then get kind of the gist of the conversation which um, they might've missed at the time. Uh, I think it's important to understand your weaknesses and strengths and to work on those. So if you know that you have difficulty concentrating, make sure that you've got the quietest place in the office to work and so on. Just knowing knowing how you work. And sometimes it can take quite a long time to work that out. You know, um, for example, if, you, if you're going to take an exam, uh, probably like the driving test or, or a professional exam, and you're going to be in a room with a load of people, you're not going to do very well if if uh, you have problems with concentration. You've got to know that and ask for a room of your own. So understand yourself. I think it's the important thing. Yeah. 
Brilliant. Thanks, experts. This is an interesting one. I mean, time's nearly beaten us, but I'm going to try and cram in a, a few more. And we've got lots of appreciative comments in the chat. So thanks, everyone. This is an interesting one. Should we get hung up on teaching spelling when technology is so good now with spell check? Why stress the kids with spelling? Any ideas? What do we think about that? Well, unfortunately, well, I, 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 was gonna say, I think we might find it's in the national <laughs> curriculum. So <laughs> we may not necessarily forget that, Gillian. Just forget that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. See, so, over to you. <laughs> She's right. You know, unfortunately, we fought for years to get this um, over to get, get around this. And then Michael Gove fought back in you know, marks being taken off for spelling. But we don't give up. We just keep plodding on and pushing and pushing and saying this shouldn't be there. This shouldn't be penalised with technology now. Um, we, we shouldn't need to have to be worrying about it. English is the most difficult language, mm. as we all know, and uh, we can't all be expected to spell well. It's really sad. Mm. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, to our questioner about should we stress our kids out unfortunately we kind of have to but do it with as sensitively as we can and I think you know teaching in multi-sensory ways with our children so on can really help as well there's ways that we can teach at home and so on um I'm just having a look guys at some of the other questions because I want to in the last few minutes try and find something uh, that we haven't kind of already addressed. Um, Sue, we had somebody earlier on, this is, I guess, for Sue and Helen, talking about, is there any interesting research around at the moment that people should be aware of in terms of new ideas around dyslexia? Or, I, I don't know, anything you want to share that's kind of been brought to your attention recently around research? This is a really good question for us, isn't it? To flag up our concerns. <laughs> you sure you didn't make it up yourself? No, but... it's in here, Sue. It was in here. Well, we're very concerned that, well, maybe maybe Helen can explain it better than me and what we're concerned about, and I'll tell you what to yeah, do I about mean, it. <laughs> we, we're concerned about um, some of the, the information that came out in the reading framework that was published by the government in July which says that systematic synthetic phonics is the only way that you should teach reading to children. Um, and the research that we've seen, there was quite a lot of um, argument presented at our um, international conference earlier this year from people. And that's, that research shows that sort of up to 25% of children can't learn to read just by this method alone. Um, and yet teachers are being um, told really that this is the only way to teach reading and indeed in the um, teacher training consultation that was put out recently that it was saying that this is the only way to teach so that's certainly some research we're looking at at the moment and something that we're going to be lobbying government to actually get that changed. Yeah we hope to raise a petition we think that many strategies should be brought in to be able to teach children to read that we shouldn't just stick to this one method of phonics teaching um, we should be able to use anything to help children and use our initiative, not be restricted. So mm -hmm. this is a really important um, uh, policy take forward for us. We want everybody to know about it and we will be uh, publicising it on our social media as soon as we get that petition up. Thank you, Donna. Brilliant. Well, um, re um, thank you for all the work that you all do because you really make a difference. Time has beaten us. So Gillian, I'm going to come to you for some closing words. Whilst you're saying goodbye to everyone and sharing your final thoughts, I'm going to bring up um, some information for Helpline, if that's OK with all our listeners. Um, we Helpline is not funded. BDA is a charity, so we do rely on donations and so on. Um, so we thank you for any support that you can give us to support our community. This evening has shown, hasn't it? There are so many questions. For those of you who feel that we didn't get round to talking about your issue, please do contact the team. You know who they are now, and they're also supported by an army of wonderful volunteers. So I will go quiet. I'll hand over to Gillian, and I'm going to share my screen as well. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, expert panel. Um, you know, we've had a really good discussion, but I am conscious that what we haven't touched on is mental health and anxiety, and there were quite a few comments about that. So, you know, if you've raised those 
issues in the chat or asked a question, as Donna said, do contact us and receive some support through our helpline. Or perhaps that's the theme for our next uh, webinar, because we often do little pop-up ones um, which are free. So uh, perhaps that's what we need to do, everybody. I can't thank you enough tonight, everyone, for, for just listening to us and sharing your own journeys. We know that it's really difficult for you and we know that it's difficult for your families. And that's the whole reason why we as a charity are here. You know, we recognise that um, in times when there's stress around not being able to access everyday life, because some of the tasks that we are required to do are really difficult, that that can bring a stress onto us and our families. And we just want to know you to know, and our message to you tonight is we see you, you're not invisible to us, and we're here to support. So, you know, once again, uh, thank you very, very much. And I guess my, my last final take home message is early intervention. It goes right back to um, the Rose Report 2009. We need our children to receive the support they need and the assessments they need at that early age and not to have to get into adulthood still struggling. So we need that journey to be much shorter. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Gillian. And you will receive the recording for this evening and some links to some of the um, information that our experts have referred to as well. There will be a link to a survey for feedback. We are listening. We always want to get better and give exactly the right service and response that all you guys need from us as well. So please do fill out that feedback survey. It really helps us. Similarly, sign up for our newsletter as well. It's a great way to keep in touch. It's a great way to get the links to the petition that Sue, uh, that Sue and Helen are going to put together. So that just leaves me to say a huge thank you to everybody. We hope you've enjoyed this session. I do have a feedback and guys we might do another pop-up at some point to get through some more of those questions isn't it but that's for another day so thank you so much everybody have a great rest of the evening and take care from us here at the British Dyslexia Association goodbye thank you